10. Let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to Genesis chapter 46. Uh, we're continuing our study in the book of Genesis. Uh, we're nearing the end of this study. We've been in the book of Genesis, I think, over two years now. And it's been a very interesting study. Uh, we will be showing uh, the video patterns for evidence, or patterns of evidence. It's a two-hour video, and we'll break it up into two uh, Sunday school times. Um, and it actually covers uh, really all the archaeology to do with the exodus and of Joseph and the Jews being in the land of Egypt. And it's, it's, very, it's fascinating, so we'll, we'll look forward to that. In the next, uh, I don't know, toward the end of the book, we'll, we'll be showing those, those videos. But th this morning we're in chapter 46. And what we've been trying to do is just to go through a chapter uh, each Sunday. And so today's lesson is in chapter 46 of Genesis. And it records for us Jacob's journey down into Egypt when he really goes to, uh, to see his son that he hadn't seen. Hadn't seen Joseph in 22 years, uh, all of that time, just until uh, really the, the last verses of this last chapter, chapter 45, is when... Uh, Jacob finds out that Joseph is still alive and of course he wouldn't believe it uh, at first but when he saw the ten donkeys laden down with the good things of Egypt he realised that uh, indeed it was true and so now he was going to go see his son. It's a very moving story um, and so uh, we're going to look at this this morning. Now this, is, uh, this journey when uh, Israel goes down into Egypt begins an experience that lasts for 430 years um, it's, it basically starts with Joseph and ends with Moses and two very important characters uh, in the history of Israel. Both of them were rejected by their brethren uh, initially. Joseph was hated by his brothers, brethren, they couldn't speak peaceably unto him. And then of course he went into the far country, married a Gentile bride and then later on his brothers received him and then he became their uh, saviour and deliverer. Same thing with Moses. When Moses was 40 years old, he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not, and they rejected him. Again, he went into the far country, married a Gentile bride, and then 40 years later he came back, and they did receive him, and, and Moses became their deliverer. These are, if you like, uh, pictures or types of the, the true and, uh, deliverer of Israel and of us all, and that is Christ. And when Jesus came unto his own, his own received him not. And so Jesus right now is in the far country. Uh, a, a, a Gentile, for the most part, Gentile bride has been, uh, uh, is being called out for him. And whosoever will may come. Uh, one of the, the uh, stipulations when the servant of Abraham went looking for a bride for Isaac was that you had to be willing. And if you're willing to trust Christ as your saviour, then you become part of that body which is his brain. And so, but when Jesus comes back again, the second time to Israel, the Bible says that he will be received by them and he will uh, be their deliverer. That, that's at the end of the tribulation period. And so, uh, so, but in between those two characters, we find this uh, long period of time uh, when uh, Israel would be uh, sojourners in the land of Egypt. Go back to Genesis chapter 15. It's interesting that when God promised the land to Abraham that he actually mentioned this. Uh, in detail, Genesis chapter 15, and there's I think there's four there's two passages in the uh, Old Testament scriptures, two passages in the New Testament that talk about this period of time. Um, there's a period of 400 years and four, a period of 430 years. Um, it's not contradictory. They were there for 400, weren't afflicted the whole 430 years, but most of that time they were. Um, and in Genesis 15 verse 13 it says. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge. And of course, he's speaking here about Egypt. And the Egyptians were judged through the, the ten plagues. Uh, God executed judgment upon all the gods, small g, of Egypt. And certainly that nation was judged. And as they uh, came after the children of Israel, in the wilderness, they were all drowned in the Red Sea as far as the, their army. And uh, that was a real devastating blow. And from that time, the Egyptians went into a, a, a dark, one of the dark periods of their history. Um, so in verse 14, And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great, great substance. 
you remember the, in Exodus it says that they spoil the Egyptians? The Egyptians gave to them gold and silver and, and jewels and so on. Um, and then verse 15, And thou shalt go to thy father in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither, uh, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. That's a very telling statement, that. In other words, God, was, God waited um, to bring uh, the exodus and, the, and through Joshua the, the conquest of the land of Canaan. Uh, because actually the, the people who lived there would, would be judged. He says the, the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet full. Uh, God was long-suffering to those people, uh, but instead of them turning in repentance, they continued on in their sin, and God brought judgment upon them. But it's interesting, uh, there in, back in Genesis 15, that God prophesied there would be this period of time when uh, Israel would be uh, in Egypt. And so we're recording here now uh, how Isaac went down. Now we have four uh, points in our outline. First of all, Jacob's faith. Let's read the first seven verses. It says, And Israel took his journey. Now let's just stop there for a moment. Because up until this point, you know, uh, Israel, whose name is Jacob, um, had a very, very rough life. And, you know, he said, Every, all these things are against me. And they didn't realize that God was in the background, actually sending Joseph ahead of them to save his whole family, to provide for his whole family. Jacob, for many years, couldn't see God. Uh, but once they came back with the good news, Joseph is still al- is yet alive. Um, he, he just um, he couldn't believe it, you know. But in that moment, there was a great change that took place. He could see God, and that God was really with him all the way. And it's interesting that um, his name changes here um, in chapter uh, 25. If you look at verse uh, 26, um, they they told him, saying, "Joseph is yet alive, and he is governor over all the land of Egypt." And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed in not. And they told him all the words of Joseph which he had said unto them. And when he saw Joseph had sent to carry him, the spirit of Jacob, their father, revived. This is something that absolutely was um, make a, a tremendous impact. And he indeed was revived in his own heart, in his own faith, as he saw the hand of God here. And so his name changed, if you look at verse 28, and Israel, they were calling him Jacob, but now this is the name that God gave to him as a prince with God. And Israel said, it is enough. Joseph, my son, is yet alive. I will go and see him before I die. And so Israel took his journey with all that he had and came to Beersheba and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee into Egypt, and I will surely bring thee up again. And Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. And Jacob rose up from Beersheba, <clears throat> and the sons of Israel carried Jacob their father and their little ones and their wives in the wagons which Pharaoh had sent to carry him. And they took their cattle and their goods which they had gotten in the land of Canaan and came into Egypt, and Jacob and all his seed with him, his sons and his sons' sons, with him his daughters and his son's daughters and all his seed brought he with him into Egypt. Now he was very excited obviously at the, in a verse uh, chapter 45 you can imagine uh, indeed he was revived and excited wanted to go see Joseph having not seen for 22 years thought he was dead um, and uh, so he took his journey probably you know just about almost immediately um, but as they're traveling south, there's, there's, so, there's, there's a place that he has to go and there's someone he has to meet. Now this would have been important to, uh, to Jacob because you remember his, his grandfather Abraham. Uh, back in Genesis chapter 12, there was a famine in the land and Abraham doubted God and he went down into Egypt and it was an absolute disaster. You know, he lies to Pharaoh about Sarah. Uh, he's rebuked by Pharaoh, then lots with him and you know, when they came back up out of Egypt, they got Lot out of Egypt, but they couldn't get Egypt out of Lot. And when Lot, Lot saw the plain uh, where, where Sodom and Gomorrah, uh, it was like the it was like the the land of like the land of Egypt. Um, and so he was attracted. He learned things in Egypt that never he could never get rid of. And so there was there was great um, problems because of Abraham's going down into Egypt, which is a type of the world. Um, and leaning upon the arm of flesh instead of trusting in the Lord. And uh, thankfully, Jacob, unlike many others, who sometimes you see these lessons and they don't learn anything from it, but he learned, and so he needed to talk to God about this. Even though it seemed like there's this massive green light, you know, 
Joseph is yet alive. He's the ruler in Egypt. I mean, what, what, what else would you do? There's a famine in the land. What would you do? But he says, no, I've got to talk to God about this. So he went to uh, Beersheba. And he offered sacrifices on the, the God of his father Isaac. In verse 2, we see that God actually does speak uh, to Israel. God speak unto Israel in the visions of the night and said, Jacob, Jacob. And he said, here am I. And you remember when Jacob first left his home? And he was about 70, maybe 77 years old at that time. You always think of the, the whole Jacob and Esau story when they were just young fellows. But they're actually in their 70s, you know. Um, and so when he left home and he came to Bethel and he had the dream of the ladder that stretched into heaven and he said surely this is the house of God and there he made a promise he said God if you will be with me as I'm leaving under the umbrella of my father's home and I'm going out on my own now if you'll be not only the God of Isaac but you'll be my God and Lord you'll give me clothes to wear and food to eat and and keep me you know, safe, then you shall be my God. And of all that thou givest me, I will surely give the tenth to thee. And so uh, Israel had these, Jacob had these encounters with God that were very, very significant. And this is a significant one because God encourages Jacob and gives him the green light to go ahead, to go ahead and go down. Uh, verse 3, I am, the, I am God, the God of thy father. Fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there make of thee a great nation. I will go down with thee in the Egypt and I will also surely bring thee up again and Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes and so God this is great a great I'm sure relief and encouragement uh, to Jacob because you know if if God doesn't go with you you, you don't want to go Amen. and uh, you know several times the scripture says you know if you go with us Lord then we'll go but if you're not going we're not going and that's really the safe place to be you need to have God no matter where you're at no matter where you're going you need to have God with you so the lesson here is we need to check with God first, even though it looks like this is exactly what the way the Lord's leading, but we need still to talk to God about it. And we need to have peace from God that this is the will of God. And many times we find is God's will and our desires are in harmony. You know, if you're delighting, you know, if you delight yourself in the Lord, that he'll give you the desires of your heart. If you're walking in the will of God, then many times his will and our desires are in harmony. If you're walking with God, um, and sometimes that's, you know, God asks you to do something maybe you don't want to do. But uh, I think for the most part, when you're walking with God, he puts that desire in you that he makes you want to do what his will is. And so we see uh, the harmony between God and Jacob here. Some people get the idea, well, if I surrender to the Lord, then, uh, you know, it would just be um, uh, he would ask me to go to Africa as a missionary or something, do something I really wouldn't want to do. Uh, that's that's not normally the case, okay? Uh, so don't be afraid of that. Also, he gives uh, Jacob an encouragement. He says, Joseph shall put his hand upon thine eyes. Well, for all these years, he thought Joseph was dead. And God's given him a promise here that Joseph will bury you. Uh, you, won't, you won't bury Joseph. You'll not have to go through that again. Joseph is going to put his hands on your eyes and close your eyes in death. And he's the one that's going to bury you. So he, didn't ha he wouldn't have to worry about that anymore. So... His, his relationship with God was first and he um, wanted, wanted to talk to God about this and of course God indeed gave him the green light. So verse 8 to verse 27 is all about Jacob's family and we'll just read through this uh, quickly, make some quick comments but in verse 8 it says and these are the names of the children of Israel which came into Egypt, Jacob and his sons. Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, of course there was four children born uh, to Leah. Reuben was the firstborn. Then there was Simeon. Now, Simeon was not a good guy. Do you remember when they were in Egypt, when his brothers came down, and, and uh, Joseph picked somebody out to put in the prison while the rest of the brothers went home? Who was it? It was Simeon. Why was that? Well, the Bible doesn't actually tell you, but I surmise that he was one of the ringleaders, probably the ringleader, when they were going to kill him. And it was Judah who suggested that he be sold for pieces of silver. And, uh, but I think Simeon had a, a, a lot of culpability there. And, but anyway, we'll see that in just a wee minute. But uh, you had Simeon, then you had Levi, then you had Judah. Judah was the fourth, and yet he was, became really the leader and the spokesman for all of them. Uh, so anyway, he goes through there, uh, the, the children here, the sons of Reuben, uh, Hanak, and uh, I'm going to have had trouble with this now all the way through here, uh, Falu and Hezron, and Carmi, the sons of Simeon, uh, Jamuel, and Jamin, and Ohad, and Jachin, uh, 
and Zohar and uh, Shaul. And then, notice how it puts this, and Shaul, the son of a Canaanitish woman. Uh, it's almost like Simeon, even though it was a group that they had repented, that there was something about Simeon that just wasn't right in his history. And as, as these names are read out here, there, there's, there's interesting things. For example, if you get down to verse 12, when it talks about the sons of Judah, uh, the sons of Judah, Ur and Onan and Shelah and Phares and Zerah, and it simply says, but Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. It doesn't say that God killed them, but he did because they were wicked and evil. It just sort of, in a sense, glosses over that. It doesn't mention that. And it doesn't mention uh, that the uh, 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 Phares, the sons of Phares, that Phares, that, you know, uh, uh, Judah basically married a Canaanite woman uh, when he had uh, his sons by uh, really his daughter-in-law, but it doesn't mention any of that. It seems like when you compare Simeon and Judah, that Judah basically, it's, it's almost like it's things are forgiven and cleaned, and it doesn't go into the detail of that. But with Simeon, it's a little different. He does make the point this uh, uh, man, Shul, was the son of a Canaanite woman. Why does it mention that? Well, it's something that God disapproved of. But anyway, you go through here, verse 11, the sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, uh, Mirai. Uh, the sons of Judah, Ur and Onan, Shelah, Phares, Zerah, but Ur and Onan died in the land of Canaan. The sons of Phares were Hezron and Hamuel. The sons of Issachar, Tola, Puva, and Job, and Simron. Now, there's an interesting one there, isn't it, Job? We're not sure if this is the Job of the Bible, but it could very well have been. We mentioned some when we talked about the Dukes of Edom, uh, that some of uh, Job's friends, Job's comforters, uh, had the same Aliphaz, for example, was the Temanite, and these were the sons of, um, of Esau. So there, there could have been a connection there. The Bible doesn't go into it, uh, but certainly this could have been very, very possibly um, the, uh, the Job of the Bible. And Simron, verse 14, and the sons of Zabulon, Sered, Elon, Jalil, these be the sons of Leah which he bore unto Jacob in Padan Aram with his daughter Dinah, all the souls of his sons and his daughters, 33. Now, instead of reading through all of these, if you just look at your notes, he begins with the sons of Leah, then he goes to the sons of Zilpah. The sons of Leah with the grandsons would be 33 in total. And also Dinah, of course, his daughter was there as well. And then the sons of Zilpah, Leah's maid, would be Gad and Asher, and their sons, and that total 16. Then the sons of Rachel, obviously just Joseph and Benjamin, and that totals 14. Uh, Joseph had two sons. Benjamin had 10 sons. In fact, Dan had only one son, and Benjamin had 10 sons. Uh, Benjamin, being the youngest, uh, almost was like, um, you know, I guess Joseph was the favorite. Uh, but Benjamin was a very favored tribe until disaster happened later on. But certainly he was blessed at this point with 10 sons. And then the sons of uh, Bilhah, which was uh, Rachel's handmaid, Dan, and Naphtali, and they have a total of seven. So this is a list of 12 sons, one daughter, 52 grandchildren, and four great-grandsons. Dan had the fewest number of sons, as we said, one. Benjamin had the largest number uh, of ten. And so if you come down to verse 27, it says, And the sons of Joseph, which were born unto him in Egypt, were two souls, and all, all the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were threescore and ten. Now, if you, and there is a way where you can uh, find out what age uh, Jacob was when different things happen. For example, when he comes before Pharaoh, he's 130. Um, Joseph had been down there for 22 years. So when Joseph was 17, Jacob would have been 108. Um, Joseph was born in the 14th year. Uh, remember, he worked seven years for, uh, for Rachel, seven years for Leah. And so when that was done, that's when Joseph was born. And then he, he meets with Laban, and Laban coaxes him to work another six years for his animal. So, um, so anyway, you can actually, so that's why you, if you take it back that way, it, it basically uh, Jacob leaves home at 77, okay? So uh, he's, he's basically an old man when he leaves home. But when he left home, what did he have? Do you remember when he was coming back? And he, he said, you know, when I crossed over this river, the only thing I had was the stick in my hand. And now when he came back, he had all these, all these children. Now when he comes down to Egypt, so he, he went from one uh, when he was you know, 77 to now he's 100 and, uh, well, uh, 130 now. And so in that period of time, he went from one to 70. So indeed, God had, 
had blessed Jacob. And of course, uh, as God told Abraham, uh, that God would go, was, is going to make a nation out of uh, Israel as they live in the land of Egypt. So indeed, God had blessed them. Look over at Exodus chapter uh, 12 for just a moment. It's interesting, uh, something about this, that we'll see here in just a second. Um, the, the complete and total were in Egypt was 430 years, as we see here in Exodus 12 and verse number 40. And there's an interesting little detail here. It says, Now the, sword, the sojourning of the children of Israel who dwelt in Egypt was 430 years, and it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, even, now notice this phrase, even the self same day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. I think what he's saying there in verse 41, that this is actually to the, to, to the very day. In other words, the same, it was 430 years to the day uh, that Israel came in, that Israel went out. Now, when did the children of Israel go out of Egypt? What day was it? Well, it was the day after the Passover, the 14th of Nisan, they had the Passover. What is the, the next day? The next day is the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the 15th of Nisan. And so, by the way, that's interesting because when they go into the land of Canaan, they go in at Passover, they have the Passover as soon as they go in. And uh, the first day of Unleavened Bread is when God stopped the manna, okay? And, that's, and then after that, they, they basically take Jericho and go on in. So it's almost like they always move that, that particular... So Joseph, or Israel comes into Egypt uh, at this particular time. Um, out of Egypt in the Exodus on the 15th of Nisan. By the way, what's the next day? What's the third day? The 16th of Nisan is the Feast of First Fruits, which speaks about resurrection. And I was just thinking, I mean, it's, you know, take it or leave it, but it, it's, it seems interesting that here's Joseph that comes down and he enters into Egypt on the 15th day of Nisan. I don't know if he met Joseph on the 15th of Nisan. Obviously, there's a journey here and he's got women and children with him in these carts. It wouldn't be beyond uh, our comprehension to say that uh, Joseph enters into Egypt on the, on the 15th day and then he meets with Joseph. The next day, which would have been the 16th day, which would have been the third day, uh, which speaks of resurrection. And if you, if you just keep that uh, thought in mind and go to verse 28 of Genesis uh, 46, it says, um, And he sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen. And they came into the land Joseph made ready his chariot and went up to meet Israel his father to Goshen, and presented himself unto him. And he fell on his neck, and wept on his neck a good way. And Israel said unto Joseph, Now let me die, since I have seen thy face, because thou art yet alive. Now, again, there's, there's wonderful typology here. Um, for, for 22 years, Jacob thought that Joseph was dead. Joseph, uh, they would have killed him, uh, but they threw him in, in a pit, an empty pit, probably a, a whale. And Judah sells him for 20 pieces of silver. They take him out of the pit and sell him into the far country. And it's, it's you know, Jesus came on to his own, his own received and that. Jesus was hated and rejected by his brethren. They uh, not only were going to kill him, but they did kill him. And he was sold for pieces of silver, 30 pieces of silver, by a man called Judas. And it's the same thing, Judah and Judas, the same name. And... Uh, and, of course, he was resurrected and went into the far country. Um, but now Jacob is seeing Joseph for the first time in 22 years. Here he's actually able to touch and, and, and handle and fall on the neck of Joseph. And they wept um, together. And Jacob says to Joseph, Now let me die since I have seen thy face because thou art yet alive. And I just have a feeling that that happened on the 16th day of Nisan which is the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The first fruits is the first fruits of the barley harvest. We talked about this last Sunday night. And uh, Jesus Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. There's more coming in the harvest, more coming in the barley harvest, the wheat harvest, the fruit harvest. Um, but Jesus Christ is the first fruits of them that slept. He's the first one in the resurrection to die no more. And that happened on the 16th of Nisan, the feast of first fruits. And here, uh, Jacob comes into Egypt on the 15th, and good possibility this happened the day after 
uh, when he actually met with Joseph and he says they're alive. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. Anyway, uh, we see also uh, number three here, Jacob's favorites. And through this story, through the whole story, there's two men that come to the fore. Of course, Joseph is the main character here, and he obviously was the favorite son of Jacob because he was the son of his old age, but he was the, the long-awaited son of Rachel, who was the one who really was his wife and the one that he loved. And of course, uh, Rachel, uh, Joseph means he shall add, and so there was another son that came, and his name was Benjamin. So Benjamin and Joseph were blood brothers, uh, full blood brothers. And J J Joseph, with the coat of many colors, he was his daddy's favorite. But there's another man that comes to the fore here, and his name is Judah. In verse 28, And he sent Judah before him unto Joseph to direct his face unto Goshen, and they came into the land of Goshen. And so uh, Judah was the fourth oldest. Reuben was the oldest. But you remember Reuben slept with uh, Bilhah? And that comes up later on when uh, Jacob blesses his sons before he dies. That was a stain upon Reuben's character that was not forgotten. Um, and then, of course, Simeon and Levi were the ones that went in, and that whole village when Dinah was taken, and they had them circumcised, and on the third day they went in and they killed every, every male among them. And Jacob talks about that when he blesses his children, their cruelty. And that's why I'm thinking Simeon had a, had a hand in this, the, the, as a ringleader when they, were, when they were taking Joseph. And, of course, Levi, he became the priestly tribe. But Judah was the one who takes the lead in all of this. When he's dealing with Joseph, he's the one that comes out. Uh, when he's dealing for Benjamin, when uh, remember the cup was found in Benjamin's sack, and Joseph says, well, he's going to be my servant forever. And Judah says, no, there's no way we're going. And they had an opportunity to go home, but they didn't go. They had it to live over again, and they did it right the second time. He says, we're not putting our daddy through this again. And Judah says, in repentance, he says, God has found out the iniquity of thy servants. He saw us from God. Uh, that God was, was uh, bringing them back to this place with Joseph and having them to live, all, live it all over again. And Judah says to Joseph, there's no way. You let Benjamin go and keep me in his place. Um, and so Judah was basically going to be his substitute. But Judah was the one that came to the fore and all of that. He became the spokesman and the leader. And really from this time on, he was. If you look over at Genesis 48, this is the prophecy concerning Jacob upon Judah. And what we find is that, is that Judah, and I think as I said before, Judah had been completely forgiven. The whole thing with, uh, with his two sons who were so wicked that the Lord slew him, and it sort of glossed over in that genealogy when he talks about it. I think uh, Judah was completely reconciled, completely forgiven. And uh, Judah went on to be uh, really the priest or the kingly tri uh, tribe, as Levi was the, the tribe of the priest, and Judah was the tribe of the kings. And in chapter 49, verse 8, Judah, Thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. That's what Judah means. Judah means praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thine enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. Uh, Judah is a lion's whelp. And, of course, Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. From the prey, my son stooped down. He couched as a lion, and as an old lion, shall, uh, who shall rouse him up? Uh, the scepter shall not depart from Judah. Now, the scepter is speaking about the king. The king, well, the scepter is the rod. It symbolizes power and his authority. Uh, a king would have a crown. Uh, he would have a robe. And he would have a scepter. And you remember when they crucified Jesus, they wove a, a, a crown of thorns, put it on his head. They put a, a scarlet robe on his back. Uh, they took the, the rod, uh, which is just a stick, and they put it in his, in his hand. They took that rod out of his hand and beat him on the head with it. And, of course, the crown of thorns was upon his head. But the scepter speaks about royalty, and it speaks about the king, the kingly tribe. It says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor our lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come. Now, we're not really sure exactly what Shiloh means, but it is a title and a name of the Messiah. Some have said it means rest giver. Until Shiloh come, and unto him, Shiloh is a person, unto him shall the gathering of the people be. That when this uh, Messiah, speaking of Christ, the, the Shiloh, the rest giver, the Messiah, the king, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now, of course, that hasn't really happened yet. Jesus has come. But it's kind of like uh, when Stephen spoke of Moses, when Moses says, A prophet like unto me shall the Lord your God raise up of your brethren, um, and him shall ye hear. Well, Israel hasn't heard 
uh, Jesus, yeah, but they will. And they haven't gathered on to him, but they will. That's still future. Unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foal unto the vine. Do you remember how he rode the little donkey into Jerusalem? And his ass's colt uh, onto the choice vine. And there was two donkeys there. There was the mother donkey and the, and the, and the, the young donkey. He rode on the, the young donkey. He had all of his belongings on the mother donkey. That, mean, that means he's coming home. You know, when our Andrew comes home for the weekend from school, he doesn't bring anything, but when he comes home at summertime, things loaded down. He's got a U-Haul in the back. doesn't really, but it's, you may as well have. Because he's coming home. And when Jesus rode on the wee donkey, there was two donkeys. There was the mother donkey and the foal. He rode on the foal. No, no man had ever ridden on it. But the, don- the, the mother donkey had all his clothes and all the, the, the coats of his disciples were there signifying he was coming home to his own house. But when he got to his own house, they refused him. And he refused them. Then for a period of time. Um, he washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. The Bible says that he shall tread the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And when he came the first time, his garments were stained with his own blood. When he comes the second time, his garments are stained with the blood of his enemies. It's a gruesome picture, but it's told over and over again. Revelation 19, um, Isaiah chapter 61. Uh, His eyes shall be red with wine, his teeth white with milk. But the important thing there is that Judah would be the kingly tribe. And of course, uh, later on, the kingdom uh, after Solomon would would split uh, between Rehoboam, Solomon's son, and Jeroboam. And you had the northern kingdom of known as Israel, ten tribes. And you had representatives of all of those tribes, plus the Levites who came south and identified with the kingdom of Rehoboam, which was called Judah. And that's why the Jews are called Jews. Where does Jew come from? Jew comes from Judah, because it was the southern kingdom of Judah that was taken into captivity by the Babylonians. And from that time on, they were nicknamed the Jews uh, for Judah because it was the Jews that came back from that captivity. So, really, Jacob has two favorites here, Judah and Joseph, and both of those men represent Christ. Judah, Jesus, is the son of Judah, um, and he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He is the king of Israel. And also, Joseph, of course, pictures Christ and that he was rejected by his own and then later became their, their savior. Um, okay, let's move on. Um, in chapter 46. And of course, we do that, you know, the, the, whole, um, the whole story is, is so, it's just absolutely, you know, pregnant with emotion. And especially when we get to this place now where finally, you know, uh, Jacob's been hearing about Joseph and, and now he's actually seen him. And old, old Joseph makes ready his chariot. Um, they went into the land of Goshen. We, again, we don't know, I've looked Goshen up, but we don't really know what it means. Um, it, the definition is drawing near. Uh, but Goshen is up on the eastern side of, of no, northern Egypt. It's in the Nile Delta. And so when the Nile comes down and it spreads out as it goes into the Mediterranean Sea, and so it's a very fertile land, and there's irrigation there. There's going to be plenty of grass for their crops and everything. It's really the best of the land, Goshen. Uh, we're not sure how far Joseph lived, um, when he, or maybe uh, if he's in uh, Pharaoh's, uh, you know, in the palace there. Um, but certainly he got his chariot ready and he went up to meet uh, Jacob as he came in to Goshen. And he presented himself to him. So Joseph, again, always did things where even though he was, you know, the prime minister, a ruler of all Egypt, and yet he came to his daddy and he presented himself to him. You know, earlier on, the sons had to bow down. His brothers had to bow down before Joseph. But not now. Joseph goes and he presents himself with respect and dignity to, to his father uh, and humility to his father, presented himself to, unto him. And then he fell on his neck and wept on his neck a good way. So they, they, were, they, they embraced and they hugged and they cried for a long, long period of time. Can you imagine? All the emotion from both those men. Uh, you know, it's interesting when, when his brothers were telling the story. And for the first time, Joseph understood, you know, what was the other side? Because for 22 years, he may have thought to himself, especially as young fellows, maybe 17, 18, 19 years old, why, do, why does my daddy come looking for me? You know, well, he didn't realize at that point that the rest of his brothers told him that, that he was dead. You know, took his coat of many colors and dipped it in the blood of a, a, a goat, and said, you know, and so old Jacob thought he was dead for 22 years. By the way, Israel today thinks that Jesus is dead. 
that Israel, Jacob think, Israel thinks that Jesus has been dead for 2,000 years. And one of these days they're going to find out that he isn't dead. He was dead. Yes, but on the third day he, he arose from the grave and he is alive forevermore. He is in the far country, seated at the Father's right hand, and a Gentile bride being married to him. But he's coming back again. And uh, he will be received by the nation of Israel, and they will understand. And in Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10, that wonderful verse, Then shall they look upon me, whom they have pierced, and they shall mourn for him as one mourns for his only son. And uh, what a day that will be when Israel repent and, and recognize and are reconciled to, to the Son of God, the one that they thought was dead for all of these years. And so here we see this emotional uh, reunion I know Jacob says, now let me die since I've seen thy face because thou art yet alive. It's kind, of, it's kind of like, you know, this is just the best. It can't get any better than this, you know. Um, anyway, look at verse 31. And Joseph said unto his brethren and unto his father's house, I will go up and show Pharaoh and say unto him, My brethren and my father's house, which were in the land of Canaan, are come unto me. And the men are shepherds, for their trade hath been to feed cattle, and they have brought their flocks and their herds and all that they have. Uh, and it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you. Now understand here, here's what you see here. Joseph becomes a, a, an intercessor, an intermediate, uh, a mediator between Pharaoh and his brethren. You know, uh, the sons of Jacob, they're, 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 they're shepherds. You know, they're cattlemen. They're men of the field. They're, uh, they're, they're not of the aristocracy. They're, they, you know, they don't know what a temple or a, a, a palace is, the, you know. And so, but old Joseph knows what it's like to live with Pharaoh. He knows what's expected. He understands what the, all the conditions would be. And he knows who his brethren is. And so he's a mediator. He stands between one and the other. And he says, now here's what's going to happen. Here's what you have to do. And he uh, maneuvered their way so that they could get the best possible uh, outcome from this. And it's the same way with Jesus. The Bible says there's one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And he is our intercessor. And he's seated at the right hand of the Father to make intercession for us. And uh, we have um, uh, a friend in heaven. We have, uh, um, I don't even like, he calls us brethren. I don't, uh, uh, I don't like to say, you know, call Jesus my brother in a sense. He calls us brethren. But we need to understand he, he is our God, our creator. Um, and we're grateful for him. But, but he is also a man. Uh, there is a man in the glory. Uh, Jesus is God, but he's also a man, and he is the perfect mediator between men and God because he is both man and God. And so he takes the hand of God and the hand of man, and he reconciles us together through his death at Calvary. But something else here in verse 33, it shall come to pass when Pharaoh shall call you, ye shall say, what is, and, and shall say, what is your occupation? See, Joseph knew exactly what, what the questions would be. He says, here's what's going to happen, and here's what you need to do. Verse 34, that ye shall say, thy servant's trade hath been about cattle from our youth. There was no lie there. They were. Um, Until now, both we and also our fathers, that ye may dwell in the land of Goshen, for every shepherd is an abomination unto the Egyptians. Now, why would Joseph say, tell them you're shepherds? Because guess what? For Pharaoh and the Egyptians, shepherds are an abomination. Now, is that not a bad thing? Well, it, it is. Now, we, we talked about this a lot. What is an abomination? It's an aversion. It's something that <coughs> turns your stomach. You don't even like to look at it. And the Egyptians didn't like shepherds. They didn't want to be near shepherds. Now, why did he do that? Because Joseph that his people were a separate people. He didn't want to bring, bring them into Egypt and then intermingle them with the Egyptians and learn the, the, the ways of the Egyptians. They were God's chosen special people. And he realized that they... They, there had to be a separation. Uh, Goshen was a land in a, in a sense unto itself, and they would have plenty of uh, pasture for their, their, their flocks and so on. Uh, but Joseph was wise enough to understand that uh, they weren't going to be there forever. They were sojourners. You know, a shepherd is really a, so a sojourner. You know, a shepherd, uh, it says of Abraham and Isaac that they dwelt in, in tents, um, and tabernacles, they never built the house, they never put roots down. Uh, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says of Abraham, for he looked for a city whose builder and maker was gone. He says, this is not it. And so they were nomads, they, they dwelled in tents, they moved around uh, much of their life, and they were sojourns. And uh, in Hebrews 11, they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. A pilgrim's not here forever, they sojourn. 
Uh, and that's why he, he mentions that. I think it's verse 4, is it? Yeah, look at verse 4 of chapter 47. And they said unto Pharaoh, For to sojourn in the land are we come, for thy servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is sore in the land of Canaan. Uh, so when they come before Pharaoh, they says, we're, we're just sojourners. We're pilgrims. We're just here for a little bit because of the famine. And when the famine's over, uh, you know, we'll, we'll probably be leaving. And of course, it was a long time after that, but they eventually did leave. But again, what we see here, because of Jacob's flocks and because of the wisdom of Joseph, he understood that there was to be separation. And of course, because of that separation, there would be persecution uh, later on. Uh, they would be afflicted. Uh, but, in, but also God would deliver them uh, through the exodus and they would one day be leaving. Now that has a lesson for you and me. Uh, the Bible says that we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Um, Israel was to be in Egypt, but not of Egypt. Um, and you and I are to be separate from this world. When we, when we got saved, now before I got saved, I belonged to the world. I loved the world. The world loved me. No problem with me. Um, I loved sin. Sin loved me. Uh, but when I repented and I turned from my sin to God, uh, then everything changed. And I took the world's uniform off and I put Christ's uniform on. I'm on Jesus' team. Amen. Now, the world doesn't like me now because I'm, I'm, I'm targeted. And, you know, uh, sometimes bad things will happen to you because you're not on their team, you're on God's team. But God wants you on his team. And he wants you to identify with his team. And he wants you to be separate from the he says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. And so there is such a thing as worldliness where Christians can um, behave like the world, think like the world, look like the world, um, see no distinction between them. Uh, but no, that's not God's way. God's way is for his people to be peculiar, a peculiar people separated unto himself, and we belong to God. Sanctification means we're separated unto God. We belong to God. And that should uh, affect every, every aspect of our lives. And so uh, Joseph made provision for that. And for the whole time that they were there, for 430 years, they were separate. And uh, they were acknowledged as a separate people. That's why they were persecuted by the Egyptians, because they feared them, because there were so many of them. And they still had their own distinct identity. And isn't that amazing? For, uh, for millennia, the Jewish people still have a distinct identity. Though they've been scattered through the, the nations and the diaspora, uh, they have been... Uh, all over the world. Um, they even lost their language. They, they lost the ability to speak Hebrew. They had no homeland of their own. They had no money. They had no, uh, not their own currency. They had no, no identity, no flag, no army, none of that. Uh, up until May 1948, when the modern state of Israel was born. And in the early uh, 1900s, uh, the ancient Hebrew uh, language was revived. Uh, as a spoken language again. Uh, that, that's something that, does, I mean, that's a recent thing that happened. And now they have their own land, their own flag, their own military, their own currency, which is the first time that's happened since the days of Nebuchadnezzar. It's an amazing thing that we have uh, witnessed in, in, since the birth of the modern state of Israel. Uh, but in spite of all of those things, they still have their own identity. Um, you know, that's, that's, that's unique. You know, you can't go to, the group of the Hittites, you know, who, who knows where the Hittites are, okay? Um, the Jews have their, their own identity. Um, and so, uh, and again, this is reflected here. Uh, Joseph understood that they needed to be separate from the Egyptians. All right, well, next time we'll continue on. We'll look forward to, uh, and we're basically ended now this, this wonderful story, um, almost ended the wonderful story of Joseph. Um, but also, uh, there's some really good stuff to come when he pronounces his blessings upon his, his sons. There's a lot of good information in there as well. And as we get toward the end of the book, then we will be showing the, the video uh, patterns for, uh, of evidence uh, concerning uh, the Jews in the land of Egypt. Is there any archaeological evidence for the Jews' presence there and the exodus? Okay, there's a lot of debate about that. Uh, but we'll see some things I think will... Uh, Certainly be interesting for you to, to watch. Father, thank you for your We're grateful, Lord, for this wonderful story. We thank you, Lord, that you've painted pictures in the Old Testament of things that will be fulfilled in the New Testament. It's amazing to me, Lord, when you, when you look at Joseph and the little details like 
uh, like Judah selling him for 20 pieces of silver, uh, just as Judas would sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And Lord, the, the different uh, types and pictures that you've painted for us to help us to recognize who the Messiah would be and what the Messiah would do. And Lord, to me, that's supernatural because of the time frame between those pictures and the fulfillment. It's just amazing. And we thank you, Lord, that you've given us those things to think about, that faith is not a leap in the dark, but it is believing the evidence that God uh, has given to us in, in your word, Lord. And we ask and pray that you'd uh, increase our faith and strengthen us, Lord, and help us to share the message of Christ with others. Bless, Lord, the service to follow, and help us, Lord, to please you and to truly worship you, Lord, in our hearts, that it may be meaningful to us and to you as well. Lord, we pray that you'll bless us this day. In Jesus' name, amen.